All right. Hey, Stephanie, you ready to start just kind of the housekeeping? Okay. I think it's a good time. Great. Um, well, thank you guys so much for joining us today. My name is Dory. I help organize the Learning Letterpress. And we have just a couple of housekeeping items that I wanted to share with you. Um, the first is that we're going to ask that you put your microphone on silent if it's not already. Um, it just helps with the ambient noise and to make sure we can all focus today. Secondly, I want to let you know that this is being recorded and will be reshared through the Hamilton page and also through the Learning Letter Press Facebook or YouTube page, excuse me. If you do not want to be on the video, I would suggest that you turn off your video camera now so that we can edit it accordingly. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much for participating in today's call. Um, we have three panelists, or groups of panelists rather, um, that are going to be speaking. And so in order to stay on time, we're going to ask I'm that you put that you might have in the chat box. Um, and then Stephanie and I will help toss those questions to our speakers as time allows. Um, if you don't have a time sensitive question, we are reserving 15 minutes for question and answer. So uh, please jot down your questions and feel free to ask them at the end. Um, and then uh, lastly, we really want to thank everybody for their time, but especially the time of our speakers who are sharing um, knowledge and experiences with us. Stephanie? Thanks so much. So um, we're so glad you're all here today. And I'm going to introduce the speakers. So I'm Stephanie Carpenter. I'm the program officer here at the Hamilton Woodtype and Printing Museum. And Dory, I really appreciate that you're allowing us to, to work together on this. I think it's great that we could come together and uh, help bring the community together in a new way. So uh, we're really excited because like Dory said, we have four individuals, uh, but from three different kind of areas. So we've got Jessica Spring and Chandler O'Leary, and they collaborated on their book, Dead Feminists. So uh, historic hero heroines in living color. Jessica is the proprietor of Springtide Press, and many of us are familiar with her Daredevil furniture. In fact, I just took a workshop, it was amazing. And it allows users to set type in innovative ways. She frequently collaborates with other artists and organizations. And Chandler O'Leary is an award-winning illustrator whose work includes books, public art, broadsides. And in addition to dead feminis uh, feminism, Chandler's activist work includes the Constituent Valentines, where she invites constituents to send thoughtfully designed postcards to their elected officials expressing an opinion. Ben Blunt is in Chicago. He's a Chicago-based designer, printmaker, and teacher. And his work explores questions of race and identity and the stories we tell ourselves about living in America. Ben's published works include the Racial Activity Coloring Book, the 275 Holidays Calendar, and First Impressions, each of which addresses systematic issues confronting Black Americans. He's a founding board member of the Artist Book House and the Organization for Positive Action and Leadership. And then our third presenter today is me, uh, Lee Marcellanis, a uh, printmaker employed by Signal Return, which is a Detroit-based nonprofit, and they're dedicated to preserving and teaching letterpress printing. Lee's work at Signal Return includes working with local artists to provide posters from carved linoleum and wood type, and in support of local service-based nonprofit organizations. Uh, in response to the killing of George Floyd, Lee was instrumental in developing a free poster uh, program where they are offering free printed posters to protesters or free custom printed posters, allowing protesters the flexibility of developing their own message. We're really glad that they could all join us today and that we're gonna hear more about activism in printmaking and the importance of power of the press. So we're gonna get started with uh, Jessica Spring and Chandler O'Leary. Thank you for inviting us. Um, and it's really great to be here with Lee and Ben and all these printers that we know. Yeah, seeing a lot of familiar names here in the list, so thank you for coming today. Um, this is a talk that we normally take an hour to do, so we're not gonna do that. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to explain what letterpress printing is, hopefully. Um, but we're going to share some slides and our, our most recent project. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, here we go. And so Chandler and I met um, right before Obama got elected. And the story goes, oh, there we go. That's Sorry, technical difficulties here. 
Um, and she came to town. She's an illustrator. This is her incredible book about some really great sites along the West Coast. And I learned she was an illustrator um, and I'm a printer. Um, this is typical of the work I do, although we work in photopolymer. Um, I like to print mostly with med metal and wood type. Um, and here's my shop in Tacoma. Chandler lives like a mile away from me. And so she came to town and um, I was really upset about the election and how everybody was talking about Sarah Palin's glasses. And I felt like it was a huge distraction from this exciting election. And I found this great quote and asked Chandler if she would draw these glasses that kind of look like Sarah Palin's glasses. So she drew this, this whole thing. And I was like, yeah, that's pretty cool. So she came over and uh, we were just gonna print one color and we took the photopolymer, cut it apart with scissors, ended up being a two color piece. Um, and we didn't know at that time, but Elizabeth Cady Stanton's words were so inspiring um, as a suffragist and a feminist. And she might not have called herself that, but it launched this series that we have been working on. We've, we're about to print our 30th broadside. Um, we'll give you a sneak preview of that. So the, the idea behind it is to um, look at historic quotes from women and tie them to issues of social justice. So we put together, um, after we did 24 prints, this book, the Dead Feminist book, and um, have continued since that time. Sorry, we're... We go. Um, and we went from pretty simple two color pieces to more extravagant four color prints. So um, with each broadside in our series, we are tying in a historical quote by an historical feminist to current political and social issues. And when we do that, we are we, we like to weave in a lot of visual imagery and symbolism and to, to kind of reinforce our theme here. So um, this is our, our 24th broadside. It's the most recent one that appears in our book. And we are doing a quote here by Queen Liliua Kalani, who was the last monarch and only queen regnant of the kingdom of Hawaii. And the imagery in here are plants and animals and birds from Hawaii and every single one of those species that we show is either threatened or extinct because we wanted to talk about the loss of culture in Hawaii due to colonialism. So there's a lot of layers in each one in our series. Um, so that that's a really important thing for us because also with each print that we come out with we are making a donation of the a portion of our proceeds to nonprofit causes that align with the social issues that we're talking about. This is a really quick video we put together to give you a sense of the process. So Chandler draws everything um, in pencil to start.
So this is the finished broadside that you can see that was in that video. Um, this is our Wangari Matai broadside, which is our most recent but one. We're working on our 30th right now, as Jessica mentioned. And again, you can see these sort of cultural influences that we have in here. We have the um, Kenyan textiles that Wangari Matai was famous for wearing, and we're using kind of the color scheme from her, from her fashion sense in the design of the print. Um, I'm going to go through just a few of these so you can sort of see some more examples of, of what we do. Um, we try to cover a wide range of topics and we really try to have a, a mix of historic women that we're working with. So very well-known women like Annie Oakley, we used a sharpshooter to talk about gun control. <laughs> um, and we, have, we try to have lesser known women, we try to have women of color, um, rather than just the same suffragists that we started the series with. We really wanted to expand as much as possible. And um, this was a, another recent one. We avoided talking about uh, reproductive choice and abortion for years. And we ended up, um, when we finally did our Simone de Beauvoir broadside just a couple of years ago, um, we ended up, it ended up not really being about abortion. It really ended up being about women's testimony and it really tied into the testimony of Dr. Christine Blasey Ford during the Kavanaugh confirmation hearings and that ended up being the real thrust of the piece. So we have now 29 finished broadsides to date. We're working on our 30th right now and um, and the thing that keeps coming back for us is that these issues that we're talking about, they are still we're still fighting these same issues. We're still making these same arguments year after year. And it only highlights how relevant it is to work with historic quotes because these women were dealing with these issues decades or even centuries ago. And so it only highlights the, the importance of using the power of the press to, to talk about these things. So um, this is our little plug, here's where to find us. <laughs> so we do have a website and everything and you can see about the causes that we support. And I am not sure how to stop sharing here. I got it. That was great. We did have one question before we move on. The Chandler, do you separate out the tones and colors as you're drawing each plate? Um, usually, yes. And in fact, we have a sneak peek to show you of our newest one that we're working on so you can kind of see how that works. So we start out when I, and I don't know, I'm just going to hold this up. I'm sorry, this is really awkward. But when it starts out in pencil like this, I draw the whole thing together so I can see how it's going to work as a whole. But then when I go to separate, I usually have the color separations in mind as I'm working. And then um, when for this newest piece it's actually only two color again and for this newest one we are doing Ida B. Wells. She is our current dead feminist and we for our 30th broadside we wanted to hearken back to this idea of the suffragists because everybody's forgotten about it because 2020 has has had other plans for us. But this is our year too. <laughs> yeah, um, 2020 is the centennial of women's suffrage in the United States so we wanted to do another suffragist how we started the series with Elizabeth Cady Stanton but we wanted to talk about intersectionality as well. And Ida B. Wells was working on an intersectional front when, during her lifetime. She was a journalist. She was working for racial causes. She was also working for suffrage causes together. And she highlights the importance of doing both together. So the color separations come into this. We have just two colors. We have red and blue, but the quote is only readable through the intersection of both colors. So here's our, this is seriously hot off the press. This came off the press less than an hour ago. <laughs> so the ink is still wet and everything. And I run the colophon separately because the type is so tiny, but we decided um, it was gonna be red and blue, two different sections. And we just decided, oh, we should make it purple. And purple was the color of the suffragists. That was sort of their symbolic color. So it, there, as you can see, there's all these little layers of meaning and history that go into each one. So yes, the color separations are always a part of it. I usually do the color separations by hand. Um, for this one, because it was so tight, I ended up having more digital help with the color separation, so I didn't, so the, the registration would be really dead on. But yeah, does that answer the question? I think so, and it's stunning. That's so nice to see. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, yes. everyone. Sorry Thank to you. go. That's great.
Great. So next we are going to move on to our second speaker, who's Ben. And Ben Blount. Uh, ben, you are, it looks like you may be on mute. Can you hear me? Yeah. You're good. We've got your Great. speaker in the other area. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm going to just show some work. I'm thinking I'm going to do it in chronological order. It's funny though, the earliest stuff I'm going to show is not actually letterpress printed. I'm a designer as well. And it's because of what's happening in the times now has come back. So uh, the first thing I'll talk about is the shirt I'm wearing, a uh, Black Lives Matter shirt. It says Black Lives Love and Strive and Hope and Struggle and Matter. So I made this shirt in 2016 in response to when Black Lives Matter was first kind of introduced and it was a, a shocking idea to, to people that black lives actually mattered and you got the whole um, all lives matter and blue lives matter and so the idea of adding the other words was to kind of just add some more context and some weight uh, and actually humanity to the phrase black lives um, and so I made this shirt 2016 kind of wore it around sold a few of them and a friend of mine uh, made posters of them. She's like, oh, you should make these as posters. And I was like, oh, I don't really have time to do that right now. So she made digital prints of them. And I've had these sitting around for three or four years. Um, and I would kind of give them as to students. And, you know, as things have been happening, George Floyd, um, all this stuff in the news, I've started to print more of these because people want these more. And I am using these to raise money because the initial, like I said, the initial print, initial print run was uh, just free. And so I wasn't trying to make money off of them. I was just giving them to like students when I would go to talks. And so um, I started selling these to just raise money for Black Lives Matter or other organizations uh, for kind of the advancement of black people. And then I did a, another fancier version with a little Oh, wrong side, a little print on it uh, in metallic silver. This is more expensive just again to raise more money for Black Lives Matter. So uh, that's the oldest project, but that's the one that's been keeping me kind of busy right now. <laughs> uh, so that was kind of the first one. Next in the list is an installation I did, but it's a series of prints. Uh, it's about the idea of white supremacy. Uh, talking about it, just People are so kind of scared of talking about racism. Again, right now, the topic is on everybody's mind and everyone wants to say Black Lives Matter, but still it's a difficult conversation or a new conversation for a lot of people. And so um, my wife, Melissa, was giving a talk, uh, a talk and saying white supremacy, white supremacy, white supremacy. And a woman said, could you not say white supremacy? Like, would you just say bias or like, White supremacy just seems so strong or so scary. You think white supremacists, you think of KKK members. Um, but white supremacy and racism are kind of, you know, white is the, the, the dominant thing in the system. So to me, they're almost interchangeable. So I wanted to do a piece talking about white supremacy and, and have people reflect on that. So I made a series of posters. White supremacy is idiotic. This is nurtured. Insidious. Exhausting. So I had a series of 15 different phrases. And so these are one from each category. So I had a, a, a different categories for for the, the phrases that kind of could describe white supremacy. So one would talk about the way that it's a planned thing. So it was, it's calculated, intentional, nurtured, the idea that it's a, a, a ridiculous thing, asinine, laughable, idiotic, the idea that it's very popular, the new black, trending, all the rage, uh, that it's a lasting thing, tenacious, virulent, insidious, insidious, and then one that's more emotional, devastating, exhausting, and traumatic. So I printed over 100 of these posters and covered a room floor to ceiling for this installation where you could go in and close the door and kind of be surrounded by these ideas. And um, 
yeah, if you had never thought about it before, it might be a way to go in there and look at it and think about all the way it impacts people, uh, people of color. And um, if you were less comfortable with it, there was a way to kind of take in the exhibit from a distance. You didn't have to actually go inside the room. But it was funny seeing people go inside the room and there was a door too, so you could close the door behind you. So I'd close the door behind people and people really got kind of nervous sometimes and just with this bolt because it was just difficult being around uh, these ideas for some people. Let's see. This one is from last February. So every time um, Black History Month whoop, away, comes around, um, you know, we always talk about Dr. Dr. Martin Luther King and he's always portrayed as a very peaceful, nonviolent person. And that's true, but he's also quite a revolutionary targeted by the government, government, eventually murdered. And so I was trying to contrast and give a fuller picture of who he was as a person. So the top of the poster is I Have a Dream, his 1963 speech. But a lot of people didn't know just a few years later, he said, uh, that dream I had that day has many points turned into a nightmare. So by 1967, seeing the reaction to uh, the civil rights movement, he saw that that dream uh, might not uh, actually come true in the way that is always portrayed um, in the media. And he's kind of trotted out as this figure, yeah, let's be peaceful, let's do it quietly, be patient. And so uh, towards the end of his life, and I think that's why he was eventually killed, he kind of had other ideas and started to bring in uh, poor people of all colors for the Poor People Campaign and really build a coalition of people that have been disenfranchised. So that was for Black History Month. Uh, this one's a little bit closer to home. I live in Evanston, which is the city just north of Chicago. It's um, it's a really it's a it's a suburb, but not uh, but still pretty urban. And but there's really good schools here. It's a uh, very well funded, and it's you know it's by the lake. It's very nice. And so people always come to Evanston for the schools and to be right by the lake. And then you're still right by the city, but it's not really suburban. And so I wrote this uh, kind of love letter to Evanston talking about the complexities of, of the situation here. So it says, Dear Evanston, I'm so glad we moved here. The schools, the lake, the inequality is close to the city, segregated, and we love Andes. And this is why, that is why we moved here five years ago because the schools and the lake, but moving here, um, uh, Evanston public schools are very good, but we have nine different wards that make up the, the city. And uh, all the war wards have their own public middle school, except for the traditionally black ward. So I learned after coming here that the reason our schools are so diverse is because the black ward sends their kids to the rest of the city to diversify the schools. Uh, and realizing that although it's diverse in numbers, uh, people don't interact as much as you might think they would. Like we literally were looking for black people when we came to Evanston. Uh, because we would go to events and be the only ones and realize they were like, you know, the cultures didn't interact in, in the way that you might have think or you might hope. And uh, the We Love Andes, Andes is just our favorite ice cream, ice cream shop. And it just closed because of uh, the coronavirus, so there's no Andes anymore either. Um, and then I was going to show you some work in progress. So Juneteenth is coming up uh, tomorrow. So if you don't know, Juneteenth is the, the kind of oldest celebration of um, freedom from enslavement. And um, so Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. I think it became in effect uh, January of 1963. But the news didn't travel to all the country immediately. So uh, in July 19th of 1865, uh, in Galveston, Texas, uh, the news finally got down to that part of the South that um, the, the enslaved people there were free. So two and a half years later, um, these people were finally found out about their freedom. And so that's celebrated as a holiday, which is Juneteenth, which is coming up on Friday. And so I've been kind of fiercely working to try to like <laughs> do some Juneteenth posters. And I still have a couple of runs to do, but, um, this is one of the, th the three. Ooh, pretty straightforward. So also, um, like I love the Black Lives Matter shirt. It's very, uh, 
it's, it's getting a good response and it's very popular, but it's also like a little more nuanced. So I wanted to do something that was a little like more straightforward, stop killing black people. Um, uh, I recently got some new type too, and part of it was I wanted to use the new type. And so this smaller uh, type I had to use, this 15 line. And so this is over two runs. So to get the spacing right, I um, had to do this in two different runs. And I'm the, the, all the series is going to use these same two fonts and have this same kind of effect with the smaller type and the larger type together. And then there's going to be a, a third run that says something about, um, you know, we're still moving towards freedom in 2020. Happy, happy Juneteenth. Uh, I have no idea about time, so that's all I'm doing right now, but I could grab more if I need to. <laughs> and you're doing great on time. We had a question from Barbara. Um, she asked if you could talk for a minute about your choice of typeface and in particular your clean layouts. Um, so maybe the question is sort of the impact or effect of your typeface choice. Yeah, um, part of it is for letterpress for me, so I'm a graphic designer. I work as, as an art director in the ad agency by, the, by day. And so my uh, printing uh, process, I want it to be different than my kind of nine to five. And so I'm big into leaning into the limitations of letterpress and working within constraints. And so I have, you know, one cabinet of wood type. And so I just try to work with that. Uh, so the one for the Dear Evanston poster, you'll see this eight line on, you know, 75% of my stuff because that's what I have. Uh, the clean layouts is uh, probably stylistic for me, number one. And number two, content, as you can see, like I'm very content forward. And so I really want the words to stand out. I don't do many illustrations or lino cuts, maybe to, for arrows or underlines or borders or something, which I don't have any of to help uh, highlight the text, but I want to, yeah, I, I like them to be typographic and graphic and bold. The black and the, and the red is probably like a little constructivist bit that I like too. But um, yeah, I try to work with what I have. Yeah, I've borrowed something here or there, usually metal type to do a colophon because I don't have that much metal, but I just work with what I have and make it work. So yeah, part of this was, um, Killing was too long to fit. I wanted to use the big type and something bold, but killing was too long and this was the way to make it work. And so I was like, oh, okay, I'll use this as the theme through all the posters stylistically. Uh, but a lot of my layouts are clean, bold type, black ink on white paper with maybe, maybe an accent. Well, and there was a good question about the printed voice workshop. Can you talk oh, about yeah. that for a minute? Yeah, I, um, I'm offering my first workshop uh, from my studio, which I'm excited about. And I wanted to try to make it as tactile and experiential as possible because that's the whole, you know, fun of letterpress. So I am, I have proved some type. So I proved uh, three of my fonts and I'm gonna make photocopies of these and send them to all the students and they'll be cutting out the letters and we'll be making pay stuffs. So I will demo how type is set on the press, the limitations of, you know, setting horizontally and perpendicular and the way things are set with furniture and regular. There's going to be no daredevil printing here. Um, and with just three fonts, so, so there's an eight line, a 12 line, and then my stymy is also 12. So you could uh, show emphasis through size change and maybe, uh, one font change, but basically you have to kind of work within these constraints. It's just black ink on white paper. So we'll do paste ups together on Zoom. And then the last paste up we do, they will glue it or tape it down and then send it to me uh, as their designs or layouts. And then I will print their layouts. So each student will get 10 copies of what they designed after the class. So they get the physical tactile nature of designing with type, with paper with type. Uh, and they also will get the happy results of their message printed on a page. So I am, um, I'm starting with 12 students to keep it small um, and so that we can have a conversation. The content, why are you printing this? Why is it important? What are you trying to emphasize? Uh, will be to have that conversation. 
and also I'll be able to print their posters without driving myself crazy. So I'm doing it for 12 students. I have eight so far, so there's four more spots. My website is Blunt Objects. My name is B-L-O-U-N-T, but it's pronounced Blunt. So BluntObjects.com is the website. And then it's one of the products on the page. It's a blue uh, product that says the printed voice, if, uh, if anyone's interested. And I'm gonna do this more than once. Um, yeah, it's so far, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. It's my first workshop that I'm offering myself. That's really exciting. We shared the link too in the uh, chat. So if you guys wanna go, oh. go see that, you can. Cool, thank you, Ben. I think we're gonna move to Detroit now. Thanks. So now we're going to go to Lee at Signal Return. Hi. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dory and Stephanie, for organizing this. And thank you, Ben, Jessica, and Chandler. It's really nice to uh, hear you talk about your projects and uh, see them on the screen. Um, I wanted to start uh, with a little, hopefully it won't be too seasick making, but a little tour of our studio because it is open to the public um, and as an, an educational organization, I feel like the space and the way it's accessed and divided is um, significant to our mission. So we have about, let's see, a 1500 square foot um, space and it's in Eastern Market in Detroit, which is just outside of downtown. Um, and it's a still a, a working farmer's market so and food food uh, service area. So we get a lot of foot traffic into our space. Um, we have about, as I say, a 1,500 square foot space. I apologize for this, <laughs> for this awkward tour. Um, the space is divided into thirds, roughly. Um, so we have about a 500 square foot retail space as people come in. And then we have a sort of central area which is, um, is sort of a prep space and a workspace, and we can also move most things around in here. So when we have readings or when we have um, uh, other events, we, we can open up the central space. Um, and then the, the far third of the studio is the, is the press area. So we have a couple of, you know, old style non-motorized guillotines that are great paper cutters. And then we have a bank of um, five flatbed cylinder presses um, that I think are pretty visible here. Um, and so that's, that's our space. Um, as I say, we get a lot of foot traffic and we get a lot of um, visitors to Detroit and also local people coming to the market on the Saturday. Um, and I wanted to talk about two main projects we've been working on for the past, the first one for the past couple of years. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, because we get so much foot traffic, um, people want to talk to us about what's happening in Detroit, where they should visit in Detroit while they're in town. People are also really interested in purchasing, um, purchasing, you know, posters or prints that are made in Detroit and that also represent Detroit, whatever that means. Um, so when I, oh, no, oh, no, when I started here, oops, there we go, sorry. Um, you know, we have some, some images of sort of Detroit buildings or some sort of images that, that represent Detroit and that they have like the latitude and longitude or something. But because we get such heavy foot traffic, um, it seemed like it was a great opportunity to think about sharing what's actually happening in Detroit, like what's happening in the neighborhoods, and sharing a little bit more about some of the really intensive and difficult work a lot of people have been doing for a long time to support Detroit in ways that aren't necessarily obvious to someone just coming to town to visit or um, someone from, you know, from the, the wealthier suburbs. Um, so we started this project which is called on, we call it on press. Um, we started it in 2018. And I'm just going to kind of scroll through um, a few images as I talk about the project because we have um, produced uh, 24 images through this project so far and it's an ongoing project. Um, so this project called on press is grant funded initially. So we thank, because we're a nonprofit, um, we, can we have received funding from, um, the Wingate Foundation, from the Knight Foundation and the Kresge Foundation, 
Um, and that's, it's important that we, that we have funds up front for this project because we invite artists to come in from the community and we pay them for their work. So we, we select artists, we invite them to come in. Um, they in turn select a service nonprofit um, that they would like to support through this project. So then they select a, an organization that they would like to support. Um, and we together make linoleum posters. So these are all hand carved linoleum prints. Um, they're, they're usually about 18 by 24 inches. So we print them on our big 325, which is non-motorized. So, um, and they, they carve linoleum. So we provide carving tools. We provide an honorarium and we provide, um, we provide basically a workshop setting, initially a group workshop and then one-on-one -on -one workshops. So we don't, we're not worried about inviting artists who already have print experience. We're inviting, we're inviting a range of artists from the community. Um, uh, the, the prints then we produce in the shop in an edition of 200. And then the prints are numbered and signed by the artists. Um, all of the prints sell for $80 each and half of the proceeds go to the organization depicted on the poster itself or, you know, that the poster was made for and half of the proceeds stay with signal return. So we'll never reprint these. They're in a limited edition of 200. Um, and so what else? Yeah. So that's that, that's that project. Um, again, we've, we've completed 24 of them, uh, hand carved linoleum, mostly three color, three, three runs. Um, and, uh, we're, we're continuing, we have 12 artists selected and, and confirmed. So we're working with a, a new, a new group. So this is an ongoing project. It's gotten a lot of nice, um, nice responses. People really like it. So it's on display in the shop as well, you know, as well as for sale. So even, uh, the $80 is sort of pricey. It's a high price point for our studio. So, um, if people are unwilling to shell out that much, they can at least take a look and, and have another sense about um, the sort of breadth and interest of, of Detroit as opposed to, um, you know, a more sort of touristy version. Um, over the past three weeks, we have shifted, uh, we've shifted to, to a project, um, all seven of us, so employees plus a couple of uh, volunteers have been working to make um, free protest posters available for, for the community, for anyone who asks, basically. We have advertised this, um, we've advertised this on our website and on Instagram um, and on Facebook. And we've basically, I feel like the, 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 the tricky part of this project to me is the organization more than anything else. So um, we have a, a a Google poll and we've asked people to fill out the poll with their contact information and the sentiment that they would like to see on their poster and the Google poll automatically populates uh, an Excel spreadsheet. So the spreadsheet includes the date of the submission um, and the contact information and the sentiment and then we have like a drop down menu so whoever wants to print how wants to print the sentiment can they'll contact the person we give everybody an addition. We give everybody 20 prints um, of their of their statement, and our hope is that you know it's enough that they don't have to be stingy with them. So they get them for free, but they also can continue to distribute the prints to their to their circles. Um, and it's gotten great response. Um, so we also print an overrun, and then we have prints available just outside the store. People can just walk by and pick up, you know, sort of rifle through and pick pick out whatever they would like. Um, what else? There's the team. There's the team working. So Ronica, Kevin, and Dania working away. We get all the presses loaded up. Um, and, and really, you know, it's, um, uh, it's um, we, we have a variety of type, which is nice, but we have only one face of 30 line. And we have about one of each letter. So we've been carving letters and trading and, uh, you know, it's a very, it's a, it's a funny negotiation on the press to try to get all of our statements equally bold printed at the same time. Um, so we have a rotating stock and as of today, we have um, 128, 118 
orders on our spreadsheet. So this is our, our bags packed and ready for pickup. We're just doing pickup outside. Um, and someone online shared this image of one of our posters actually in use. So, so that's, that's all I have. I'm gonna turn off the screen sharing. This is so great. Thank you so much um, to all of our panelists for sharing your work. I think um, all of the comments have said how inspiring each of you has been to the individuals attending today. We did have a couple of questions that, come, that came through the chat that I just wanted to pose to everyone as a starter. So why did you choose letterpress as a medium? And let's go ahead and start with Jessica and Chandler. I would say we were really attracted to the idea of the democratic multiple and the historic connection to broadsides, um, putting a political opinion up uh, for people to see. And we've always kept the price low. Our broadsides are 40 bucks. And um, then we reprint as postcards so that people can get them. And that was always the idea was to get the work out there and not have it be the other work we do is maybe ends up in special collections but this work anybody can afford which we felt was critical i think for us too there um we're doing limited edition prints we do not reprint the letterpress broadsides once they sell out and that we've gotten a lot of blowback on that over the years people have been like why don't you just do another edition but it's really important to us to have that limited edition and actually our edition numbers are symbolic as well that along with all of the imagery that's in there the edition numbers also play into what we're talking about so for instance um when we did our shirley chisholm broadside our edition number was the number of delegates that she earned during the primaries. So each one has a number like that. And so keeping it limited edition makes sense for us. And that only plays into using a hand printed broadside rather than an offset printed poster. Plus, you know, broads, broadsides, opportunity for a pun. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> then why do you choose letterpress? Uh, I came from a design background. My undergrad uh, major was graphic design, and I just took a, a evening class at a local college and just kind of fell in love with it. So the tactile nature, again, contrasting with what my day job is and like you know getting your body physically and your hands involved in it, just really appealed to me. And so I think it's that tactile nature that I really loved, and and the focus on typography. Thank you. Lee? Um, I feel like it's the most um, expandable, maybe, of the print media. I mean, I think it can be, it can be very fast, so you can also take it really slow. You can do very, very fine detailed work, or you can do sort of, you know, big, big sloppy, you know, big sloppy stuff. So I feel like it's really, it's, um, I, I think it's a, it's a great practical, great, great practical tool with a really wide breadth of possibilities. Also, it's really, it's fun. I mean, I don't know, it's, it's all fun. <laughs> That's great. Well, we have about um, 10, 15 minutes remaining that we could take some questions. What I would ask is that, make sure that you unmute yourself before you ask a question. And then if you're directing it towards a specific panelist, if you would let us know who you're asking the question of. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, I see a question from Brad Vetter. Um, can you guys talk about the balance of making money um, with your activist work that sometimes doesn't have any remuneration or doesn't pay the bills? So how do you balance that? Um, <laughs> well, I, I can't speak for everybody, but it, I think I think for all, I, I, would, I would guess that for all of us, it's certainly true for me, that this activist work is not the only work that we do. So we had, like, like Ben works as a designer. Um, I think we, it is a balance. We're trying to fit this in amongst our other work so that we can keep a roof over our heads and, you know, pay for press space and everything else. But, um, but at least for us, for, for the Dead Feminist series, it is important to us to have that democratic price point. Um, but we also, we also have, we kind of now, nowadays we're kind of balancing the collectors versus the democratic multiples. So we actually have a system now where our three most recent designs are 40 bucks. That's always been our price. And then if we have older 
broadsides where we just have a few left that are kind of out of print, we raise the price on those and that attracts collectors and permanent collections and things. And then we also have our postcards. And so we actually, we actually make a, a, a little bit of money from this, from this project. So we're able to pay ourselves. We're able to keep the project going and pay for paper and everything else. And it helps us still be able to give money back to the foundation that we started, the Dead Feminist Fund, and these nonprofits that we support. So it's not a lot of money. We're making small gifts. We're making a small amount of money, but it's it's at least sustainable enough that we've been able to do it for 12 years. And hopefully we can keep growing it at a level that's sustainable for us to be able to keep doing it. Uh, you want to go, Lee, or? Oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, that whole balance is always on my mind. I think part of it, I have a sort of an activist bit anyway. That's kind of what my work is no matter what. And so, I don't know, it's just the work I'm passionate about. And I guess seeing the influence and seeing the impact that people get so excited over getting these printed works on paper. And I feel like that's my way to contribute. Like I have this press uh, and there's a lot of people who want to say things and, you know, you get, everyone gets a, uh, suggestions on oh you should print this and you should print this <laughs> but um yeah i feel like it's my way of 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 doing something i could raise money that way i can get a message out there that way there's a lot of people who aren't going to necessarily march are just thinking about race or just thinking about these things for the very first time and so maybe the first thing they can do is grab a poster and put it up or put a black lives matter sign on their yard and like everyone's like that's not much yeah but everybody's not going to do everything so if that's the start when we go where we're going forward doing more stuff, at least you have your sign up, at least you're not standing in the way. And so I feel like it a lot, I help uh, facilitate other people getting involved in well, and so, as well. And so that makes me feel like it's worthwhile. Totally. Lee? I, th I think, um, I think we, we try to um, sort of approach uh, printing from many angles, I think here, um, but it does certainly help that we are a, a nonprofit, and so that we are eligible to apply for for grants that can actually just just support, um, you know, can support um, projects that don't necessarily need to to result in an income for us. Um, but I'm also no expert. Our director is the one who takes care of the finances. I luckily just get to, you know. Uh, just to get to mostly print, but we do take on job work um, and design work and we ho host workshops and we host, um, you know, like corporate, corporate retreats. People come in with, um, you know, people come in for an hour or something like that and set some type and we have a little food and drink. And so we do a lot of, we do a variety of events. So, um, but I agree, I agree with something that Barbara said in the comments. Um, the activist work is really is really great in that it really bl brings um, the best positive positive vibes and um, support you know real tangible support from the community um, and hopefully it also um, is is a valuable is a valuable thing and maybe two years down the line you know something will come of it that is not immediately obvious so I think I would add also that um, post twenty sixteen. I feel like there's been a shift uh, and I think artists in general tend to be more willing to, to be out there with their own political opinions. And I, I saw right after the 2016 election, I saw a lot of people responding to artists and saying, I, I don't want to hear your political opinions on your Instagram feed. I'm just here for pretty pictures. And a lot of artists stood up and said, no, you know, our very lives are political. This is going to creep into our work anyway. And if, politics are affecting our personal lives, which they do, that's how this works. We can't make pretty pictures for you if, if we're living in oppression. And so I think, I think in the last few years, I think more and more artists have been willing to come forward and bring activism into their work. And I think it's been a really important shift. And it's great to see that community build over this. And I think it only helps the, I think it helps really change things over time. If, if like Ben said, maybe not everybody's out marching in the streets, maybe not everybody's demanding of their senators in their offices, but if everybody's shifting their thinking a little bit, that is gonna contribute as well. Well said.
Oh, Dory, I think we lost Sorry. you. I don't want to be the only one asking questions. So if you have a question, please ask. But I, I do have one that I thought of. It seems um, like the role of history and research in particular plays a part in all of your processes. Um, am I understanding that correctly? And sort of how do you how do you feel about conveying history or the research through your work? I would say that the, the added benefit of using a historical tools, historical materials that are sort of imbued with every printer's text that was used before us or in, you know, Ben talks about posters with multiple um, uses over many, many posters it sort of like gets laden with this history mm -hmm. um, as well as the opportunity to go back and touch on historical topics too. Mm -hmm. um, I, I love that melding of process with, with history. We also are, we are fighting the same fights that our foremothers and forefathers were fighting. And, and I think it's important to know that so that we're not, alone and we're, we're not starting from scratch. And our, our Ida B. Wells print that we're working on, I mean, we are still fighting these same fights that she was fighting in the 1890s. I mean, she, she did an exhaustive investigative journalism um, series and work on lynching. And here we are, there have been six men lynched in, since May 31st. And so we're still fighting these same fights. And when women got the vote in 1920, that not all women got the vote in 1920. There were many women who were still disenfranchised and voters, including women, are still disenfranchised today. So having this historical bent, I think is really important because history is not something that's dead. It's something that is still happening. And it's, it's still, we're still trying to problem solve the same way we always have been. And I think of it as a way to kind of represent history to people. A lot of times this history isn't widely available, but a lot of times the way it is available, people just wouldn't want to read it. Like some people just won't read a book about black history or read a book about this. But if I make a poster that's a little bit of funny or a book that is humorous in the beginning, but as you go through, like the layers start to hit you, it's a way to give the information to people in a way that they could take it in a different way. So I do think about that, like changing the context a little bit, making it more palatable to some extent or making it uh, so it can go a little bit deeper layers wise. I, I always think about, um, I don't know, I love this idea that type, type goes in and out of fashion, typefaces go in and out of fashion. Um, and, and I always, I don't know, I think the, the process is to, be, is to be honored. I mean, I think that the designs, the type designs are, I don't know if, if this is actually correct, but anyway, to all the type designs are useful. It just depends what you need to use them for. Um, and the same with the linoleum. I mean, it's a, it's a carving of a block and you can, whatever you can think of to carve and print, you, you can do it. Um, so I do think, um, I agree with you Chandler, um, this, this honoring of the process is really, is really important, but I also like that it can be, I mean, it's not immediate as compared to sort of a, you know, an image posted on Instagram, but it, it, there is still an immediacy and a specificity in terms of the colors you can mix and the sort of the, the, the tactility that is, is really magical. People walk into the shop and they just have, they make this huge like, <gasps> like, what is this place? What happens here? You know, and so we get that added, you know, it's fun if you have time. Sometimes it's annoying because you try to work, but it's great to see people come in and just have this like weird moment where they, I don't know, they like fall in love or fall into a different time time um era or uh, yeah it's it's um it's still very um i don't know it's very potent it's still very potent when you see a student pull a print off oh, of yeah. the best thing ever because they're like oh my god it worked <laughs> it's such a great sight and i i mean i've been seeing that for years and years and years now and that never that joy never goes away it's so oh, it's like magical I think the other funny thing about that is that they think that they did it. You know, you, you spend hours getting everything locked up and they print it and it's like, oh my God, look what I made. <laughs> oh my goodness. We've been Blair. doing this morning with our Ida Wells print. We, when we, like, you can't read it until the two colors go together. And so when we did the first one, we were like, <gasps> it works. <laughs> it still works. <laughs>